honor our mothers and the women in our lives, would you please stand with me in honor of God's word? And I think you'll find that today's passage is very applicable, maybe a little too applicable. <laughs> Let's read it. I'll read it now together. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing. And will you read that last part with me? If they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. This is God's word. And I believe even difficult passages like this are true. Father God, we ask that you would be with us this morning as we study your word. Father, I pray that whatever is of me, my friends here would forget, but Lord, whatever is of you, that they would hold on to and that they would be able to apply to their lives. Father God, speak through me. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. August 26th, 1920. Over a hundred years ago, marked a pivotal moment in the history of our nation. Because on that day, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States was officially adopted and certified. Does anybody know what the 19th Amendment was? The right for women to vote. Women can now vote. And this was a major victory in the women's suffrage movement because now for the first time in politics, women had a voice. And over the past hundred years, it's incredible to think about how much has changed and how crucial women have become and are in our world and country today. The voice of women has legitimately changed the course of presidential elections. Women have been given a voice in the political arena, whether they're serving as governors or congresswomen or senators or on the Supreme Court, uh, serving as Supreme Court justices or running on a major political party platform with President Harris being the, or Vice President Harris becoming the first woman to hold that office. I wasn't making a prediction there about President Harris. <laughs> In the world of business, women have led and continue to lead large corporations serving as CEOs and presidents. And even in our local economy, in New Alban and Lansing, there are businesses and restaurants that are owned and run by women. Women have a voice in the classroom teaching the next generation. The voice of women is growing louder in modern science and medicine and engineering. And e women even have a voice in sports, serving as referees and in broadcasting. The voice of women is making a crucial impact on us today. But why is it, over these past hundred years, that the one place where for many it seems that the voice of women is not being heard is in the church. Well, today we are uh, entering the third week of our series in 1 Timothy called Fight the Good Fight, in which we are studying the Apostle Paul's letter to a young pastor named Timothy. And the first chapter of this book can be summarized this way. Timothy needs to fight for focus in the work of the gospel. And the reason this is given is in chapter 1, verse 4, to promote stewardship that is uh, from God by faith. And more literally translated, the idea here is that of God's good order. In a world that's been ravaged by uh, sin-induced chaos, the church represents God's good order that's found in the gospel. And so now that he's laid this foundation in chapter 1, chapter 2 marks the introduction of some of the specific ways in which this order is seen. 
And since it's Mother's Day, I want to uh, I was originally going to do the whole of chapter 2, but there's just so much here that I'm going to jump ahead to verse 8 and talk specifically about what Paul says about women in the church, and we'll look at the rest of this chapter at a different time. And so this morning, our crucial question is this. What is the role of women in the church? And I want to begin by just admitting that this conversation is complex. There's a lot to be considered here. And so I think it's fair to say that no matter where we land at the end of this, there's always more that could be said, right? There's more that could be considered. There's more that could be weighed in. But with this in mind, I want to look and recognize three different views that most people have when they come to the passages like this. And, and this comes from a commentary uh, on this subject. And uh, I think these views will kind of help us identify the lens in which we see the Bible through as we look at it together. And so the first view is, is the view of a critical feminist, the critical feminist perspective. This perspective sees the Bible as traditionalist, and so it promotes misogyny, and it oppresses women. And in this view, the Bible is wrong. The second view is the evangelical feminist. In this view, the Bible is feminist, in that it's egalitarian, which means that men and women are seen as completely equal in the church, in their roles and functions. And thus, this liberates women. And in this view, the Bible is right. They would say that the Bible is inerrant and true. And the final view is the view of the evangelical traditionalist, which is also called complementarianism. In this view, the Bible is traditionalist, but its advocacy of loving leadership lets women thrive. And this view also says the Bible's right. So men and women have equal but distinct roles in the church in, 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 in such a way that it, they complement each other. So these are the three different ways in which we can look at this passage this morning. But I want to start right away by just crossing off that first view, the view of the critical feminist. I'm confident in outright rejecting the first view, first of all, because it, it, it asserts that the Bible is wrong, right? As I said at the beginning, I believe that the Word of God is true. And although we could talk more specifically about the reliability of the Bible, for our purposes today, I think we can just trust what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 3 uh, that all Scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for training in righteousness, but perhaps if you uh, label yourself a critical feminist, if you fall into that category, and you would say, maybe you would say that you believe the teachings of Jesus, and you believe even portions of the New Testament, but you just personally have a problem with Paul, because you feel like Paul is misogynist in what he writes. If that's you, consider what the Apostle Peter writes in 2 Peter 3.16. And speaking of Paul, he says that his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. And so he's admitting that Paul's letters are, in fact, inspired scripture, but he's also saying that we need to work hard to understand exactly what Paul is getting at in his letters, because we don't want to distort their meaning in any way. So what Paul writes here should be considered to us as inspired scripture. And we should work together diligently to investigate what he's trying to say. But we should also reject this view for the fact that Jesus and even Paul himself were radical in the ways that they elevated women in their cultural context. I think it's clear uh, in the Bible that Paul specifically was not an oppressor of women. Two examples. First, in Galatians 3, Paul writes that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Before the foot of the cross, we all have equal access and status before God through Jesus. Secondly, in Romans 16, Paul gives an extensive list of his constituents in ministry and many of them are women including phoebe who he calls a deaconess or a servant of the church 
as well as Priscilla, who Paul refers to as a fellow worker. And just from looking at that, it seems to me that Paul saw women as having an active role in the church and not inferior to him in any way. So I think we can reject that first view, the critical feminist view. And so for the purposes of this morning, I want to look at those two remaining views. The egalitarian evangelical feminist view versus the evangelical traditionalist or the complementarian view. And just for the record, to give a little background on me, I've served in churches of both perspectives. I was on staff at a church where my direct supervisor was a female associate pastor. I was a part, this church had a leadership board, they didn't call it elders, but on their leadership board they had men and women. And women would preach very regularly. This church was egalitarian in its beliefs and practices. But I've also been in churches where elders and pastors could only be men and where men only preached. These churches were complementarian. And so I've walked in both lanes in this way. I've served in both kinds of contexts. But regardless of my experience and regardless of my opinions and regardless of anyone's opinion in this room, what I want to do today is to look at the text itself consider what we need to consider, cultural context, as well as what the Bible says, so that we can have a correct understanding of this. Are we all on the same page there? So my guess is probably everyone in the room would be mad about something at the end of this, which I guess, you know, whatever. But anyway, so let's look at this now together. 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 8. Paul says, I desire then that in every place men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly attire, but with, with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So very quickly, Paul begins this passage with a quick comment for the men. In verse 1, Paul urges prayers be made for all people. But Paul wants to make it clear what is that there is a wrong way in which you can pray. If you come before God in prayer, but your prayer is motivated from a place of anger or contempt, Paul's saying that's sinful. As David writes about a wicked man in Psalm 109, Let his prayers be counted as sin. And so it's important to worship that men are praying and praising God in a manner that's honoring to him and that promotes unity in the church, not in a way that would cause disorder or division. Because remember, one of Paul's primary concerns in this letter is establishing what is God's good order in the church. It's very critical. And so disorderly prayers need to be addressed. And obviously, though it's directed at men, This also could be applied to women, and the same is true uh, vice versa with the next issue, and that's the issue of modesty. Though here Paul is specifically focusing on the appearance of women in the church. In the same way that men's improper prayer was dishonoring or distracting from worship, likewise, as Paul says, the outward appearance of women was problematic. And I think it can be said that there are two issues with the way that women are dressing, are dressing to the point that it's disrupting worship services. There's two, two reasons why Paul would address this. The first is the issue of promiscuity. Now, again, when looking at this issue, it's really important that we talk about something, and that's cultural context, specifically the context of the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was known as an epicenter, of pagan religion, with the most notable uh, uh, trademark being the cult of Diana. There was a huge temple dedicated to Diana. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And Diana was the uh, goddess of fertility. And in this cult, you would go to the temple, and you would be led in worship by the spiritual leaders there. And all of those leaders were women. But put frankly, they were serving as temple prostitutes. You would go to the temple and you would see a temple 
prostitute. And so in all likelihood, there are women in this church who are uh, now Christians who have been saved from this cult and who even maybe served as priestesses in uh, this temple as their former prostitutes. And so how this all relates to dress was that there was a certain way that prostitutes would dress. Most women at the time wore a traditional form of clothing called the stola, while men wore a toga. If you've ever been to a toga party, you might know what I'm talking about. Um, I, don't, I couldn't find a great picture comparing the two, but men would normally wear togas, but prostitutes would also wear togas, which were usually more colorful and usually a little more revealing. And if you were a high-end prostitute, you might wear some gold uh, bracelets or earrings with that as well. And so I think it can be inferred that there are women coming into the church dressed in the manner of prostitutes, and whether they meant to or not, were advertising promiscuity by their appearance. And so the first reason he talks about modesty is largely based on the, the context of the city of Ephesus, and I think context also plays a role in the second reason. You see, this early church was composed of all kinds of people, right? You had former prostitutes worshiping next to former Pharisees. You had wealthy members of society worshiping next to slaves. And so in the, se the second reason why people might wear expensive clothing and jewelry, jewelry was for pretension. In other words, they wanted to impress people. They wanted people to notice them, to highlight their wealth. The wealthy women would have their hair complexly braided. And with every step, their pearls and gold necklaces, their no nose rings, and their bracelets would jingle like a walking Christmas tree, right? They wanted everyone to notice them. And so you have to understand, the reason P Paul is calling this out isn't because he hates feminine fashion. That's not what he's trying to say. It's because the fashion displays were attempts by some to highlight themselves rather than draw attention towards God. And so in contrast to the promiscuous or the pretentious outfits, Paul urges women to dress modestly in a way that would properly reflect who they are in Christ. And perhaps Paul is thinking of Proverbs 31, that ultimately charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And it's very similar to what Peter says in 1 Peter 3. Do not let your adorning be external, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart. And so here's the point for us today. The goal of modesty, whether you're a woman or a man, isn't just to divert attention away from your appearance, but ultimately what you want to do is to glorify God through what you wear. So there isn't necessarily a set standard for what external modesty looks like. It's not necessarily a particular kind of swimsuit. It's not specifically shorts of a specific lake, like Paul doesn't give us the measurements for that, or it's not even a certain hairstyle. Paul's not prescribing women to stick to a designated clothing selection or to forgo jewelry of all kinds. There's some churches like that where you can't wear any jewelry at all. The point is that Paul is asking women in this church, and really all of us today, to be mindful how you are representing Christ to those around you, in what you say, in what you do, and in what you wear. All of that matters. It matters what you wear. And so that's the conversation surrounding modesty. But now we get into the more controversial waters. Look with me at verse 11. As he says, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. All right, so Paul here is dealing with male authority. Specifically, the authority of men over women in the church. And again, as I work my way through this, I, I ask for your grace because I'm just trying to do my best to be as fair to both sides of the perspective and try to get a, a clear picture of what the Bible's actually saying. And so again, as we do that, we do need to consider the cultural context. 
So there's two reasons why, culturally speaking, Paul might not want women to speak or teach in the church in this particular context. And the first is what we just talked about, namely the presence of the temple of Diana in Ephesus. Remember, many women in that town were considered to be spiritual teachers and leaders. But it just wasn't the great, a good kind of worship, right? And so Paul is trying to say, hey, maybe we should stick away from this because this will send the wrong message. People might want to come to church for the wrong reasons. And so that's an argument that can be made from an egalitarian perspective, but there's a potential problem. Paul doesn't just write this way to the people in the city of Ephesus. He also writes like this to the church in Corinth. He says the, that women should be, keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they should be in submission, as the law also says. If there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's shameful for a woman to speak in a church. Different city, different context, same message. So the question is, is how do we explain that as well. Well, this leads us to a second consideration and really a more practical reason why women wouldn't be allowed to teach. In that cultural context, specifically a Jewish context, women weren't well educated. The boys and men would spend their time, especially boys growing up, would spend their time studying the law, studying the Old Testament, looking at the prophets, while women would focus on other more traditional things like household chores, how to cook, how to clean, those sorts of things. And so Paul is addressing two issues found in both of these churches. So first, he's saying that because women aren't as well educated, they shouldn't be the ones teaching. They don't have that background information. And secondly, because they didn't have this background information, when a reference was made in church, even if it was a man preaching or speaking, and they didn't understand, women would often ask their husbands, their more educated husband, what it meant. But the problem is that their husband was usually sitting on the opposite side of the church. Women would sit here, men would sit here. And so you'd have women during the church, hey, what does that mean? You know, like disrupting the service, obviously. I don't know if you can relate to this at all, but uh, usually whenever I watch a movie with my wife, Laura, uh, especially if it's a science fiction movie, She'll often ask me a question during the movie. Hey, what does that mean? Why did he do that? What's going to happen? <laughs> and I, as she's asking me this question, usually I, because she's asking me the question, I'm distracted, so I miss what's going on in the show that probably could have answered the question, and so we're both confused, right? So that's kind of like what's going on here, right? Women are asking questions during the service, and it's causing church disorder. Paul is therefore saying, for the sake of order, wives should just wait until after the service to ask their husband any questions. Women should stay quiet in the church and ask questions later. But here's one crucial thing that you've got to notice about all of this. Through our modern eyes, we read verse 11 and we get upset because he says, let a woman learn in quietness and submissiveness, right? Women got to be quiet in church and we get mad about that. But you can't miss that first part of the verse. Paul says, let a woman learn in a context where where women weren't given any opportunity to learn the Old Testament, in a context where women weren't permitted to study the book of the law, Paul is saying, let a woman learn. Let her learn. Timothy, if there's women in your church who want to learn, make sure they do so in an appropriate way. In this church, in the church as a whole, women are expected to be actively learning and growing in their faith, just like the men. That's not oppressive, especially in that context. That's liberating. Let a woman learn. And so at this point, it kind of maybe feels like we're rolling full 
steam ahead with the more egalitarian view, the more the, the evangelical feminist view, that women have a place in the church, a prominent place in the church, but there's one major consideration that should give us a pause. That's verse 13. Paul says women aren't permitted to have authority because Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the women was deceived and became a transgressor. And this is important because what Paul is doing here is he's referring to something that can't be explained by cultural context. He's referring to something that goes back to the very beginning. The order of creation and the order of the fall. Again, this is a very provocative statement by Paul. So I want to make a couple of things clear on what he's saying, what he isn't saying. So for starters, Paul is not saying that Adam that because Adam was created first, that men are spiritually superior to women. One reason I think we can say this is that because that Greek word for, you know, Adam was made first or that Eve was deceived first is the Greek word protos. And Paul uses that word in chapter 1, verse 15. It says, Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the protos. I'm the first, the foremost, the worst. Paul, a man, sees himself as the first of sinners. So he's not saying that, uh, he's, he, that he's superior to women. And even though that, that there's been false teaching that's infiltrated this church, the only people responsible who are named aren't women, but two men. So clearly men are just as susceptible to sin as women are. Can I get an amen? Amen. Secondly, Paul isn't just saying that Adam isn't responsible for the original sin, that Adam doesn't have any responsibility. In fact, Paul refers to Adam throughout his letters as the prototype for all sinners. He often compares Adam with Christ, the one man versus the new man, the old man versus the new man. As he says in Romans 5.12, sin came into the world through one man. It is through Adam that sin entered the world. But if that's what he's not saying, what is he actually saying? He's appealing first to God's ordering in creation. That he created Adam first and then made Eve as a helper to come alongside the man in his life, in life, as we're told in Genesis 2. In other words, Eve was created to complement Adam, to strengthen him in the ways that he was weak. Men and women are therefore created differently, but they have equal, uh, they're equal, and therefore they're reliant on each other. First Corinthians, in the Lord, women is not independent of man, nor man of women. For as a woman was made from man, so man is now born of women. Yet, it does appear that one of the roles of the man is to be the primary leader, both from what we see here and from other passage, passages specifically talking about marriage. And so Paul is appealing to Genesis, the Genesis narrative as a way of promoting God's good order in the church, which is the primary authority of men. So let's wrap up this passage in verse 15, and we'll kind of talk about what this means for us today. How can we apply this? Look at verse 15. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> Yet she will be, or the woman will be saved through childbearing, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. So the chapter ends by Paul commenting on motherhood, which is fitting for today, but again, he does it in a way that's controversial. Eve, the first woman, sinned first, setting a precedent of women suffering through childbirth through which they will be saved. What? Right? Right? Whatever happened to saved by faith alone or through faith alone? What's the deal with this childbearing business? Is a woman's salvation and her worth wrapped up in her having and raising children? 
This is especially troubling if you consider that not all women can have children and not all women raise children, right? So what does this mean? Well, again, let's consider the context. First, it's likely that some of the false teaching and myths circulating around this church were discouraging practices such as having children and getting married. And so Paul is saying, hey, this is a good thing. This goes back to the very beginning. This is a great thing. And it's actually a grace from God. And so building off this idea, Paul is saying that women should lean into their womanhood. Don't minimize it or suppress it. And I think this applies to all the intricate aspects of who a woman is, whether it's uh, you know, the unique aspects of her character and personality to the ability of some to have children. These things aren't to be despised and rejected. They're to be praised and pursued in whatever fashion that is. I think we've seen that in our culture, a devaluing of having kids and raising a family. Paul's saying that's a good thing. That's a good thing. In fact, I would dare to argue that God is the ultimate feminist and that he endorses womanhood. He puts a stamp on approval on womanhood. He doesn't want it to be suppressed. He wants women to be uniquely themselves. And finally, it's important to note that motherhood is not the way a woman is saved, right? Because Paul says that women will be saved if they continue in faith. In faith. Women who hear and believe the gospel by faith will be saved. So as we end our time together, I want to finish by again trying to answer that question I asked at first. What is the role of women in the church? Can women be pastors? Can women preach? How do we apply this passage to everyday church life? Well, here are my two cents from what I have gathered. And again, you can disagree with me. That's okay. Uh, I, I respect that. I don't think this is a salvation issue. Regarding women as pastors, I'm under the impression that based on passages like 1 Timothy 2 and, and others, like in Corinthians, that women should not be the primary lead teaching pastor in the church. This is in line with the Evangelical Free Church. This is the denomination that we're a part of. And, and that's the position they take. Women aren't ordained as pastors. And since the qualifications for elders are pretty much identical to that of pastor in the Bible, I would argue that women should not fill that role either, that eldership is for men. However, I am convinced that there are definitive roles that women can and should take part in. For instance, the role of deacon. And we'll discuss that in depth in chapter 3, but deaconesses are a biblical position in the church. Women can also serve on staff at a church. The free church is welcome to that, welcomes that, I welcome that as well. But I do have a personal problem with the labels we give women in church, serving as, at, on churches as staff. Because what oftentimes happens in churches uh, like evangelical free churches is that we'll have, if we have a man serving in that position, we'll call him a children's pastor or we'll call him a youth pastor. But if it's a woman serving in that position, we'll call her the children's director or the youth director. But they're doing the exact same thing. And so what ultimately happens, sadly, is that it's an excuse for churches to not pay the woman as much or just not show her as much respect. Honestly, I've seen that happen. I think that's silly. So I don't endorse women as lead pastors, but I, I might be open to calling an associate uh, woman staff member a pastor, right? Because that's what she's doing. Right? She's serving as a pastor. It's a minor detail. I think it's important. Debatable, whatever. But related to this, I'm not personally against women preaching on occasion for a couple of reasons. One, in the cultural context of 1 Timothy, women weren't permitted to teach primarily because they weren't as well educated. But now there are women in churches who have higher uh, training in Bible, whether it's a bachelor's degree or a master's in divinity degree, which I personally do not have. So it would be kind of silly, like if there's a woman in the church who had a master's of divinity and I, we didn't let her preach, like, I don't know, I just feel like 
th- that, that's not a problem in the sense of women being educated. Women are educated, right? Things have changed. But perhaps even more significantly than that, do you know who the first person to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ was? Mary Magdalene, right? It was a woman. She, she, Jesus tells her in John 20, go to my brothers and say to them, and it says Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he said these things to her. So Jesus at that time called this woman to proclaim the good news of the resurrection to men. Why wouldn't he do the same thing now? Something to consider. And again, just to be clear, that would be done under the authority of a head pastor, male pastor, under the authority of an elder board. And the woman wouldn't be the primary teacher, right? But her voice would still be heard. I'll add this small caveat and then I'll be done. I do also believe that if men punt or abandon their responsibility for position, uh, the position of authority in the church, that God does sometimes call women to fill that gap. So an example of this would be in Judges 4, when the prophetess Deborah tells a man named Barak, not Obama, to lead an army, uh, lead God's army, but Barak won't do it without her. And so Deborah ends by taking over as the primary leader, and and she says to him, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Caesarea into the hands of a woman. So practically speaking, Deborah fills that gap for Barak. In our life, it would be like, you know, if, if, a, if a teenage boy's father went around, the mom would teach him how to shave. And in the same way, if, we were, if our church, God forbid, ever came to a point where there was no men who were willing or qualified to be elders, I would have to have women elders. Because that's a role in the church that needs to be fulfilled. There needs to be accountability there. There need to be elders. So there's no men, they'd have to be women. Again, that's a caveat, that's an that's a, a exception, it's not the rule, but sometimes God does call women to fill the gap for men. So it's a reminder to men to be active in spiritual maturity, be actively seeking growth. So again, I would summarize all that we've talked about by going back to 1 Timothy 2.11. Let a woman learn. Let a woman learn. Women are a pivotal part of the church. Women are designed by God to serve and build up the body of Christ. Men are not independent of women. Women are needed. Women are wanted. Women should be built up and allowed to lead and serve in the church for the sake of the gospel. Let women learn. Let their voice be heard. Would you please pray with me? Father God, We thank you for your word, and we just thank you for the difficulty of it sometimes. That passages like this should cause us to lean in to your word, to study it, to understand it, to let it build us up. And Lord, I I admit that I could be wrong. And anything I've said today. So again, Lord, I ask that you would speak through me despite of me, that your truth would be made clear. But Lord, we, I trust you that you are good. And that, Lord, you, you use your word to train up and build in righteousness. So Lord, I pray that today that the discussion wouldn't end here, but that the discussion could continue. That, that um, we could talk about how we can appreciate and show love and respect for the women in our lives. And how we as a church can be active in giving them a voice in a biblical and appropriate manner, Father God. So Lord, submit all this to you in, in, in your hands and we ask that you be with us as we go from this place. So it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you, church family. Would you please stand with me? I want to give a blessing to you, but also specifically to the women. A Mother's Day blessing from Proverbs 31. 
May strength and dignity be your clothing. May you laugh at the time to come. May you open your mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness be on your tongue. May you look well to the ways of your household. And may you not eat the bread of idleness. May your children and husband rise up and call you blessed.